All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Twimmel AI podcast. I'm your host, Sam Charrington, and today I'm joined by Fatih Porikli, Senior Director of Artificial Intelligence at Qualcomm. Before we get into today's conversation, be sure to take a moment to head over to Apple Podcasts or your listening platform of choice. And if you enjoy the show, we'd greatly appreciate your five-star rating and review. Fatih, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Sam. This is a pleasure. I'm very excited. I'm all yours. All righty. I'm really looking forward to digging into our conversation. We'll be talking a lot about your research in the areas of computer vision and perception. Uh, But before we do that, I'd love to have you share a little bit about your background and how you came to work in the field. Um, I am a computer scientist and electrical engineer. I was on the both sides of the fence, the fence dividing academia and industry several times. You know, as everyone, I started my PhD. I did some research. I was a research assistant. I stayed at the university. Then I moved to industry. Many years after that, uh, working on real problems, very challenging problems, uh, maybe 13 years after that, I switched back to academia again. I was a full professor, tenured professor for a long time. And uh, then I found myself uh, intentionally, of course, uh, in industry again, even uh, trying to solve bigger problems, trying to create bigger impact for everyone. So now I'm with uh, Qualcomm. And the whole time, have you been working on computer vision or have you uh, switched areas of interest? Computer vision was always uh, there. Uh, that is uh, one of the things uh, really excites me, amazes me, because uh, if we consider human brain electrical activity, maybe 70, 75% of what we actually consume in our uh, brain uh, dedicated to visual perception, a significant portion of brain is also goes to visual understanding. So vision is the way that we understand, make sense of the world, life, everything around us. Actually, if we close uh, uh, our eyes, you know, I just close, uh, loss of vision might be the most devastating disability. You know, it comes so naturally to us, the way that we understand the 3D scene, recognize people, recognize faces, recognize objects. So then I was al- almost always interested in how we can make computers, machines to you know uh, have that capability as well, this visual understanding, visual perception. So computer vision has been always there. Before maybe, let's say, 25, 30 years ago, it was more conventional, engineered solutions. You think about, okay, what would the human perception do? How would brain work? And how I'm going to sit down and write some mathematical description to convert it to something a computer would understand? Now we are kind of, as you, as many of uh, us, uh, us are very familiar, we are using AI, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, to make it uh, natural, uh, look into data and uh, learn something automatically from observing the environment around us. Awesome. Awesome. Can you um, share a little bit more uh, around your areas of interest from a research perspective? Under perception, there are several modalities. Uh, One is uh, working with uh, image and uh, video data. Uh, This would be directly related to computer vision. And then there there is 3D uh, data, point cloud and 3D representations. That's also, I will say, that computer vision as well. But perception is not only uh, in these two modalities, uh, 3D point cloud and image video visual data. There is also RF radio frequency signals all around us. And they are, in a way, uh, kind of the uh, uh, light that we see. They are all around us uh, filling the space. We also look into those invisible frequencies and try to understand everything about the scene, about the world, about uh, how everything works, objects, interacts. So uh, these are the modalities that I'm very much interested in it. What do we do with these modalities? For instance, in images and videos and 3D point cloud data, RF signals, um, any signal actually, including X-ray and you know ultrasound, uh, we 
detect things. Uh, for instance, whether there is a vehicle or uh, a person on the street, we reconstruct 3D model of the uh, world around us. Uh, that's also very interesting, very challenging, actually, if you want to just use one single image, not two, like uh, uh, we do. We have two left and right eye, so we use stereoscopic vision. But can you do it just using a single camera image? And the answer is yes, for a while. You know, I was really impressed with that one. Uh, and uh, recognizing activities, uh, labeling everything in the scene. In a way that what goes on the lower level in our brain, we want to do all of these, accomplish all of kind of those processes, uh, perception, and uh, all of them were very interesting to me personally. And these uh, tasks, this understanding goes into many applications from, let's say, XR, augmented reality and virtual reality to autonomous vehicles to robotics, IoT, you can imagine, wherever there, there is a human being, uh, and uh, if you replace or put a machine in front of it, kind of uh, those applications exist all around us, and uh, computer vision enables all of those, and that's why I think it's very exciting to me. <laughs> and uh, some of these problems are big problems, Sam. They are not solved problems. They are uh, presenting a big challenge. So that's another attractiveness uh, for many people. So I want to dig into a few of the uh, perception-related papers that you've got at CBPR this year. And uh, the first of the ones is a paper on, uh, on panoptic segmentation. Uh, the full title is Panoptic Instance and Semantic Relations, a Relational Context Encoder to Enhance Panoptic Segmentation. Uh, let's start you know, at the beginning. Uh, what is panoptic segmentation? Yeah, it's a long title, Sam. <laughs> panoptic <laughs> segmentation. So there are things and stuff around us, right? Things are the countable things, like there is one vehicle, another vehicle, another vehicle, one glass, another glass, one person, another person. But there are also uncountable things, like sky, like building, like road is not countable, right? So segmentation, the goal of segmentation, take this visual information, images and video, or point cloud, and then label every pixel, every region, with uh, the identity of that region. For instance, if it's a sky, if we see sky, it will tell, computer will tell that, okay, this is a sky pixel, that specific pixel and the region. If there is a person, it will tell, this is person, but it's not going to just say person. It's, it's going to say that this is person A and another person B. Even though they are occluded each other, maybe half of the person B is visible, it will still distinguish. So this is a very challenging task. We are trying to label all data pixels, in this case, with these corresponding things and stuff identities. That is what panoptic segmentation does. And so, from that, in that sense, it is kind of a, a superset of instance segmentation, which is identifying the things, and semantic segmentation, which is more focused on the stuff. Very good. Absolutely. Yes. Actually, that's the right technical description. Instance segmentation and semantic segmentation together will give uh, would be under the panoptic segmentation. Describe the the setting for this paper, what is the problem that you set out to solve? So now we understand what panoptic segmentation is. And uh, as uh, maybe I should point out that recently there has been significant attention and excitement around a new technology in AI, which is called as uh, transformers. So what transformer is, let me very briefly mention that when we give an uh, image, data, video, algorithm learns which parts of, for instance, image are related to each other. It knows uh, to collect such supportive information, pay right attention to the right parts. For instance, if there is a vehicle part, a tire would uh, you know, uh, put more com confidence uh, if, let's say, we want to detect a vehicle to, uh, with the hood of the vehicle, door of the vehicle. But road pixels, sky pixel, 
they will, even though they may look similar, attention mechanism will ignore those. So it will focus on the better part supportive evidence to, you know, make such deductions. Uh, so transformer is uh, self-attention, ad advanced self-attention mechanism. It is important to relate these areas, image areas, and it has been applied to semantic segmentation before. Now, uh, the challenging part for panoptic segmentation, there are you know, unknown random number of things like these instances of the other classes like people and vehicles in the scene. How are we going to use transformers to make sure that this instance of, uh, let's say this person uh, kind of is different this transform mechanism would uh, distinguish from the other person. Otherwise, uh, since they are, they look same, they will, uh, regular transformer will think that oh, they are same thing and it may not uh, distinguish these two. For panoptic segmentation, we want to label them separately. So uh, this paper explains first time in the world how you can actually kind of combine uh, this type of attention mechanism into a segmentation framework. Got it. And so what have prior approaches tried to do for solving panoptic segmentation? On a high level, we can consider uh, there are a single shot or, uh, you know, multi-shot uh, settings, single shot setting. It aims to take an input image and directly label each pixel as a different object, instance of an object, like this person and the other person. And uh, there are multi-shot algorithms, multi-shot meaning first we find uh, these uh, regions of interest. Uh, you can think that those are like boxes. You say, okay, this is like a box. I There's a person here, another person here, another person here. Then uh, in the second stage, we go and look, okay, these two, uh, this box contains a single instance of a person and it doesn't overlap with anything. Okay, good. Then I will just go, you know, do segmentation within this box and I will find segment up to person. If there is overlap, then I will uh, kind of infer which one, which pixel is belongs to which person. There are two or multiple persons. So this is the other way of doing that. Uh, usually these algorithms lacked an attention mechanism across different uh, instances. We can do it pixel-wise, but if I have one person here, another person behind it, another person far away, how I'm going to learn where to focus if I want to detect all of them at the same time? Um, so this is what we accomplish. Uh, for a different number, varying number of instances, uh, uh, CVPR paper shows that you can uh, learn or uh, uh, train an algorithm that would learn uh, to focus on the right areas of the image, which then improves the accuracy of the segmentation. That's what we show in the paper. Got it. Got it. Uh, I think this is maybe related to the single shot versus multi-shot, but I got the impression from the paper that one of the big things that you're doing differently here is that previous attempts have tried to, hey, in order to solve panoptic segmentation, let's do image segmentation or instance segmentation and uh, then semantic se segmentation separately and kind of put the results together, whereas you're doing them uh, as part of a, a consistent, a coherent system. Absolutely. Very good point. Uh, now, uh, the same network can do in an end-to-end -end fashion these two tests together. And when you do it together in an end-to-end -end fashion in the same network, they support each other. They don't uh, kind of dismiss what, for instance, semantic segmentation would generate or instant segmentation would generate. They leverage uh, together uh, and uh, which generates better uh, improved numbers, honestly. What were some of the, the biggest challenges to this approach? Transformer architecture uh, or self-attention architecture, uh, one challenge I can say that uh, they are computationally, uh, you know, intensive and uh, how to 
make them efficient was a challenge. And also, you know, uh, our paper is not specific to any specific uh, backbone. A backbone usually considered as a pre-processing neural network takes image or video and then creates useful features for the downstream task, like uh, semantic, panoptic, or instance segmentation or many other tasks. Our algorithm, our idea actually, can apply to any backbone, uh, any you know, uh, kind of a segmentation framework, it could be plugged in to improve their performance. In the paper, we tried maybe more than 15, around 20 uh, different uh, segmentation algorithms, and every time we plugged in this type of uh, transformer-based uh, instance uh, uh, self-attention with the, uh, you know, kind of semantic seg uh, attention, the results were much better. How do you have both the ability to plug in whatever segmentation model you want to use? The, or, um, was that specifically for the instant segmentation or for either of the components? What uh, our algorithm does, it uh, leverages the these features coming from the previous segmentation algorithm and then it takes them and it learns reweighting them. In a way, that's what transformer does. The input to transformer is some kind of, let's simplify it, let's say it is an image, output is another image, let's say, uh, but uh, what you see like uh, maybe now much clearer and focus on the right parts. Maybe input image, you can think that is a noisy image and there are some you know, kind of like things not very visible in the output, now much sharper and uh, kind of these things are uh, clearly distinguishable. Of course, uh, it is not an image but goes into this uh, network. It is a set of feature vectors and it's called as the features uh, uh, for uh, image. Each pixel has a feature descriptor. Those de descriptors goes into this component and comes in a better, uh, more trustable, uh, kind of more um, useful uh, uh, manner. You know, when we do that, when we make the features better, any downstream task will benefit from that. So. Uh, all these segmentation algorithms, they have this type of feature generators, either at the beginning or at the end. So this idea can plug uh, kind of uh, and directly apply to those feature maps. Got it. Got it. So the the core of what you've done is this transformer that takes as input these feature vectors. And you don't really care how the feature vectors are created. Any of these algorithms um, that you've tried, it worked just fine as part of your your network yes this is the strength of it it can take any of the features and make them better you know more representative of the task that we want to accomplish uh, however uh, this is also something novel in the paper then we use this thing and we also go back to the previous stages like feature generator and uh, other branches to make them even more accurate so Kind of uh, when we do end-to-end -end training using uh, PISR, uh, the paper, the idea that we uh, talk about in the paper, all network becomes uh, kind of updated and even the previous part, feature generation part improves. So overall, kind of that uh, further improves the accuracy. Semantic segmentation, you know, panoptic segmentation is one of the most challenging tests in computer vision. It's very difficult for a human to segment. By the way, if you want to do, if I, if you ask me to go, you know, label each instance, I will do something. But if you ask another person, it will do differently. You know, even for humans, there is significant variation uh, in the outputs of how we, you know, do panoptic segmentation instance and semantic segmentation for. A computer vision algorithm for a machine to do it even more challenging. Uh, so this type of ideas really uh, kind of pushes the state of the art such that you know they are becoming more and more feasible for bigger use cases to improve our daily lives.
through these applications in XR and auto and other type of uh, use cases. Uh, how did you measure the performance of your model? There are very recognized metrics and there are benchmark data sets. So we uh, huge benchmark data sets. We, uh, those benchmark data sets have the ground truth information uh, one way or another defined. These are real also data sets, uh, real images, real videos. We use those metrics, for instance, uh, uh, mean IOU uh, or similar metrics. Uh, it defines how well one uh, mask, uh, object mask, uh, overlaps with another one. So this is very common in semantic segmentation. For instance segmentation, there, there are similar, you know, advanced versions of this thing now, considering uh, whether uh, kind of they are confusing identity of the instances or not. So there are these common metrics and benchmarks uh, that uh, that's how we evaluate the algorithm. And what kind of results did you see? When we submitted the paper, we look at all the existing state of the art, existing work, including the archive, uh, things uh, appeared on the archive, not maybe published, but very fresh things. So just before the submission deadline, um, the previous week, we applied whatever we found, and uh, every time uh, we observed uh, improvement on this uh, segmentation uh, pipelines, and uh, our results also when we submitted to different or investigated, you know, re generated results on these benchmarks were the top of the line. And uh, in the paper, we showed that you know those are the uh, best segmentation results possible. Uh, of course, the field is changing. Maybe uh, next uh, CVPR, uh, there might be even better numbers uh, that might be coming from us or other people. But at that time, it was the number one um, uh, on multiple data sets also, not one data set. OK. And, and where do you see this particular line of research heading? Is it a solve? Is, is panoptic segmentation a solved problem now? I uh, think when the conditions uh, are right, uh, it is uh, its performance is you know almost product quality level, but uh, there is significant variation in the input quality. For instance, it could be a dark image, it could be a very noisy image, it could be a blurred image. You know, uh, that you can imagine. You know, th there might be many problems in the image. Things may be very small. Some of the objects might be very tiny and not maybe only, let's say, a hand of a person would be visible, you know, significantly occluded. And the, our goal is actually detect that hand as well, you know, kind of uh, even though only it's the hand. So those type of very difficult uh, settings uh, still require more work to make the algorithm uh, to be more robust, generalize those type of uh, challenging situations. And also, uh, another thing, if, for instance, we use a data set and that data set collected in a, a specific uh, manner using maybe the similar type of cameras and labeling might be similar and the lighting might be similar, uh, but now in a specific application, the environment, lighting, everything would be different. How to adapt to that such domain changes, domain variations is one thing. Another thing, uh, Sam, uh, I mean, we don't, th these things, uh, instances could be any class, right? I maybe repeated many times, like it could be a person, it could be a vehicle, but it could be anything, right? It could be, you know, uh, a piece of machinery. It could be a kind of component in an assembly line. You can imagine, you know, it could be a bird, multiple birds, you know, for uh, kind of, you can imagine uh, this is like a commodity, this type of AI solution. People would like to take it and count the number of ants, you know, in a lab setting, those type of things. So uh, how to adapt automatically with minimal labeling to such different classes, different type of things, different type of stuff uh, for semantic and instant segmentation, it is... I think still a challenge, uh, and we are working on all of those problems, which would, for instance, take our solution and automatically adapt to a very different, completely different, you know, 
class, uh, set of classes, different type of objects. So um, uh, there is still work to be done, um, but the quality of the segmentation results for key applications, for instance, camera essentials, for autonomous vehicles, for XR applications, for robotics, I think uh, it's very promising and soon such solutions either from us or maybe you know everyone anyone in the world uh, using our solutions will uh, appear in products i'm very confident about it awesome does this approach assume prior knowledge of the classes i was envisioning this uh like an autonomous vehicle type of scenario where you you know you have a camera off of um you know, a picture of a road, a camera off of the front of the vehicle, and there's something in the road, and you're trying to differentiate, you know, not something in the road versus something in the road. But that's a different problem than what we're talking about here. Oh, that's maybe obstacle detection, or, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. we have a class of unrecognizable things as well. Uh, there are ways to solve it. Uh, yes, uh, that is also possible. But if it's supervised solution, if the target crisis changes, it's a problem. You have to do this transfer learning. There is a specific term for that. You know, uh, my uh, goal, target crisis now change. How I'm going to leverage uh, on the previous network uh, that I trained and maybe some portion of the previous data, anything semantically related, semantic information, and now I can adapt to this type of things. To detect things are not even be defined. Uh, usually, uh, it uh, there, there is a class of unidentified things. We don't know what they are. Like these are I unidentified object classes. U F O like U O C something. You know, we can give it a name. But uh, then uh, maybe some other intelligent mechanism has to decide. Or oh, is it something that I should worry about it if I'm uh, approaching that thing, is it going to be a problem for us or not? We are, of course, that's a more higher level inference. Uh, there are ways of doing that. Supervised learning, of course, limited. Now at Qualcomm also, we are looking at self-supervised solutions or unsupervised solutions exactly for, uh, this is one of the reasons, you know, we cannot expect people to generate these data labels, grant route to train these algorithms over and over again. And human beings, we don't learn that way, right? I mean, it's not like here is an example of a cat, example of a dog, example of a you know tiger, uh, and then we re remember that we know when we see an animal, uh, kind of uh, that is uh, an animal, you know. Kind of, it is not like uh, I don't need a training data. Even if I don't see it, I would infer, you know, I would deduce that okay, it looks like a tiger, so it might be some type of tiger. So. We do it uh, using this continual uh, self and unsupervised learning, uh, uh, and we are we have solutions actually, you know, kind of uh, applied to different tasks. In this paper, we don't uh, really talk about that, but uh, that is uh, something we are very active on it as well. Uh, another paper that we wanted to chat about was the imposing consistency for optical flow estimation paper. Um, tell us about the, the problem that you're trying to solve there. Yeah, absolutely. So optical flow uh, is finding where each pixel in the current image was in the previous image. So in a way, it is motion. Uh, it uh, describes pixel-wise motion. Uh, why this is important? Because if I know where the pixel was in the previous frame, then, you know, uh, first of all, I know how things are moving in the scene. I can deduce about, about uh, the camera motion, and then I can also understand object motion. Uh, for instance, we have a headset, uh, XR headset, and or AR glass. Uh, we are moving our head, and this is moves, but then some other people also move, so we know this type of motion, which is important, and also, I can relate the previous frame to when I compute uh, or make deduction for the current frame. So motion uh, is important and optical flow is uh, what you would uh, uh, 
obtain if you uh, correspond this pixel with its previous location in the previous frame. So it looks like a field, you know, lots of kind of like motion, motion vector, vector from yeah. individual motion. pixels to the next to where that pixel ends up in the next frame. Of course, yeah, it could be from current frame to the previous frame or previous frame sure. to the current frame or current to the future frame. We can predict also, absolutely, Sam. Got it. And so what's the approach that you took uh, with, with this paper? So one challenge, uh, again, in AI, in data-driven learning, the data set, the, what I mentioned before, uh, we need uh, ground truth data for supervised training, uh, here is, let's say, two images, like the current frame and the previous frame, video frames, and this is the optical flow, motion between them. So we can, you know, if we synthesize those images, we, can, we know we control everything. We might have a game engine, for instance, or any you know any software can generate uh, this type of different. We can, for instance, move the image, uh, things in the image uh, in a game, and we know how they moved. That type of ground truth is available. But if we have real images, you know how we are going to find the ground truth? Like how each pixel is moved is not like something measurable. You can think that it's a much harder uh, labeling problem than what we just talked about, which was already hard. So, <laughs> such data sets, I mean, still computed data sets. Uh, there are some data sets, uh, smaller scale. And in AI, we want big data sets, you know, huge data sets with tens of thousands of samples. It doesn't exist. Um, so if we don't have the data set, we will not have a good model. Uh, so in this paper, what we show that you know, you do not need such a big data set. We will do self-supervised learning, unsupervised learning. We will, for instance, take the previous image and we will do some uh, transformations on it. We will rotate it, we will warp it, and we will apply lots of different degradations, you know, without really destroying the image. Still, you know, it's like similar scene. And when we look at it, you know, it would maybe look a little bit noisier or less noisier or the color is different, but maybe it's also war uh, warped. So we do all type uh, this type of transformations and uh, we know because we applied those, we defined those transformations, so we know the ground truth in that way. So what about leveraging on that thing? And if we do that, you know, um, kind of uh, optical flow should be consistent with the way that we warp transform the image that's one thing uh, we also look uh, okay if i do forward if i go backward what would happen also when let's say there's my hand is moving right in front of uh, uh, my uh, uh, face and uh, then it moves either it occludes some parts or uh, reveals some other part and that's important if i have two frames it's not like every pixel is going to be visible in both images, right? This is called as occlusion and uh, occlusion map. We want our network to not, you know, um, handicapped by the occlusion areas. So if we detect such occlusion areas automatically, and if we manage them automatically again in the network, maybe as a separate, you know, channel estimating those occlusion maps, uh, it would, uh, overall, it would benefit during training and in the inference time also explicitly by estimating such occlusion mass. So this paper does all of these things that I mentioned. And, and just to, to elaborate on what you just said, it sounds like what you're trying to do is not necessarily teach the network to predict occlusion or anything like that for its own benefit, but rather you're trying to teach the network to identify when there is occlusion so it doesn't take the the ground truth that it's creating otherwise and it it, it knows if that data is going to be bad because it's uh, you can't relate the one pixel to the next absolutely uh, occlusion masks are not available i mean we uh, synthesize them this is the self supervision part and also Kind of these transformations, we define them, and it will 
we it is a large set of transformations and we then apply all these training you know uh, improvements enhancements uh, novelties to a network uh, which is um, uh, one of the state of the art uh, models uh, for optical flow motion computation it uh, creates these cost volumes and uh, in different scales and then it starts with uh, a previous optical flow or just random you know initialized optical flow and every time it iterates itself at these iterations the optical flow estimated optical flow becomes more and more refined more accurate and especially high resolution so that is what we uh, do when we for instance take these ideas training ideas uh, self-supervised unsupervised training ideas and modify the network such that now it can also do occlusion reasoning and uh, kind of train it in this manner with the existing data sets you know still a simple data set even uh, on those uh, data sets it improves the performance um, and uh, there, there is a benchmark there are multiple benchmarks actually one is called as kitty the other one is Sintel. in both those benchmarks uh, our solution was uh, when we submitted and later also you know kind of because it's an open benchmark uh, it was uh, uh, ranking on the top of the leaderboard and if I'm not mistaken there are more than 200 you know solutions hundreds of them is somehow AI based deep learning based um, so that was quite uh, good news uh, we weren't uh, you know uh, expecting but we were confident this is the right solution to do and uh, yeah it went to the top of the leaderboard with that solution what is the what's the future direction for the for this particular approach very good question sam uh, this solution since since it requires uh, big cost volumes and uh, iterations they are computationally expensive and uh, they require a lot of memory because of the cost volumes and because of the iterations they are slow so what we are working on now and uh, you know kind of uh, we will have a demo very soon now we show that the same solution could run on a mobile phone on a qualcomm platform in real time uh, for a large input size input image size large video size um, so this is uh, uh, th this has been quite uh, you know a, a, an excitement for us uh, we put a lot of effort to make it more efficient uh, yeah this is our uh, current work and we also want to extend it to other things you can do this type of things uh, for one camera and this is one video right uh, on the same camera but you can do uh, optical flow or which is called a scene flow across multiple cameras uh, and you will find 3D motion, not 2D motion. So we are extending to that. And optical flow is core for many other, you know, uh, perception tasks and higher level understanding. We are now plugging this solution into different pipelines to see how much improvement we would get. Uh, super resolution is one of them, for instance. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well. There's one more paper that you have at CVPR, and we wanted to make sure to touch on that one as well. The next one is dense vision transformers for single image inverse rendering in indoor right. scenes. Uh, this particular one's focused on inverse rendering. What's that problem? So usually when we synthesize a scene, we know about 3D, we know about the objects, like there's a couch, there's a chair, uh, there's a ball and we know the color of those we also know their properties uh, reflectance properties we want to generate a scene computer graphics so we know the location of the light uh, we know many things about the scene like surface normals albedo roughness you know you can imagine uh, so it would look real time real life uh, so inverse rendering so this is rendering this synthesizing that i mentioned inverse rendering starts on the other end it takes an image natural image and uh, then it tries to find these components for instance the lighting location lighting direction lighting intensity room shape uh, i mean for indoors 
um, and the properties of the everything, objects, all the objects in the scene, their shape, uh, their color, their materials, whether it's leather or you know metal or wood or cloth, those type of things. So inverse rendering takes an image, real image, and uh, kind of finds finds these components. Each one of them, you can think that is either an image, you know, uh, a reflectance image, a color image, albedo image, uh, or a three D model, you know, or, or lighting location, you know, heat maps and those type of things. This is the inverse rendering pipeline. And this paper uses a um, transformer-based idea to accomplish that. Uh, and so how is inverse rendering uh, previously done when you're not using transformers? Previously, but recently also, I should say, because uh, deep learning-based uh, solutions for inverse rendering are not that old either, maybe at most a couple of years. Uh, uh, but uh, people did. Uh, okay, here is the input image, and I know 3D model because uh, I generated that input image, and now I'm going to uh, switch the order. I will give input image and try to estimate the 3D shape. And I know also the surface normals. And I know the color, you know, I know the color of the objects. I know the locations of the objects. I know the reflectivity of the objects. I know the lighting location. So kind of this is done in a supervised manner. Uh, and separately. I think kind of the key word here is these type of things done separately and there has not been any attempt to uh, learn uh, for each task and across multiple tasks uh, where to focus when we are doing this type of uh, inverse rendering. If there is an image, if I want to, let's say, generate the lighting location and lighting direction, uh, which part of the scene image provides the right information that has not been done before. And so this particular uh, approach and using the transformer, again, you reference this idea of the transformer's ability to uh, attend to the right uh, and the most important parts of the image. That's a, a big part of what's making this work. Yes, transformers does that. In this case, we incorporated uh, such self-attention or cross-attention mechanisms into uh, our work, into inverse rendering to uh, improve the accuracy of each of these uh, inverse rendering tests and also lighting estimation. So when we have that, uh, when we decompose an image into this type of components, uh, then we factorize it, then we can, for instance, put anything in the scene. We know the lighting location, we know how it reflects from you know, other objects in the scene. Uh, and uh, it would look more realistic, more natural, much more natural. So, uh, and for instance, one application would be, here is an input image, and then we put a completely virtual objects in a way that, you know, all the shadows are correct. It's very difficult to, you know, distinguish what we inserted edited uh, in the image than any other things already exist in the image. Yeah, I, I, I'm so excited about that work. That's what I, <laughs> I forgot, but I should have said it. For instance, we have an image of uh, a real scene, a house, let's say, and right. uh, walls have a specific color, Sam. Now I can change the wall color, or I can change, for instance, there's a couch here. I can make the leather couch to a cloth, you know, some different fabric. So we can really modify the scenes in a very realistic manner. Right, in a way that preserves that realism without it um, yes. falling apart. Yeah. And so what, what were the, I'm imagining challenges here again, you know, with you using transformers or the computational intensity of the approach is one of them? Uh, in this case, we didn't focus on computational in, uh, kind of uh, intensity. Yes, it's computational very heavy, and uh, we uh, plan to uh, kind of uh, make it also very efficient. There's no question about that. But uh, one of the challenges was lighting direction estimation is not a straightforward problem because uh, it's difficult to take an image and before knowing about the location of the light and also 3D scene structure, 
deduce about the lighting direction. I mean, you can imagine this lighting, there is a window, there is a sun outside the window. By the way, this window is not visible in the image. It is like right in front of me, there is a window and you don't see it, right? In this test, our goal is to find where that window is and where the sun is, you know, not this direction, but this direction. So this is kind of what we want to do if we want to really put an object in a way that, you know, shadows are correct, ambient lighting is correct. So we are imagining, estimating the um, invisible things in the image. If it's visible, it's much, straight, much more easier. So we are estimating the remaining part of the scene room, for instance, uh, and that cannot be done, you know, using just an input image directly going to there. You need to go step by step, first get an idea about the room layout, 3D scene structure, you know, reflectivity, all type of cues, then leveraging on those uh, and with attention mechanism transformers where to believe in the previously computed information. Okay, where is the light now? Invisible lights. What was what was the direction of the light? What was the properties of light? Uh, so that was the challenging part. <laughs> And what kind of constraints are you making on the the image? You know, for example, uh, you have a, a good number of candles behind you. Are you limiting the number of light sources that you're assuming to be in the image, for example? It's a good question. We don't actually. That is quite restricted to number of uh, light sources. Type of light sources are maybe shape of the light sources. There are some assumptions for windows, you know, there are maybe some additional assumptions. It It is retained for indoor scenes. Maybe I should mention uh, this is uh, specifically due to the data, data set that we use, Open Rooms data set and ScanNet. Uh, it is for indoor scenes, uh, but it could be any number of lights, you know, kind of, uh, yeah. Before we wrap up, Qualcomm has a number of other activities at CVPR. Let's briefly have you share a little bit about those. One is a workshop on wireless AI perception. What's that one about? Absolutely. Um, that is the first time a wireless uh, AI perception, wireless itself, is becoming a workshop at CVPR. CVPR is uh, more visual data. And, you know, there has been some other modalities as well, but not uh, at a degree of a workshop. And if we look at the field, we see that people are using cameras in addition to together with, let's say, Wi-Fi or, you know, or 5G or terrorist imaging. So, uh, for instance, uh, there is a Wi-Fi around me right now and there is a camera and together they accomplish more things than just using the camera or the Wi-Fi Separately. In this workshop, we bring the leaders in the field. Um, they will. They are going to give us uh, several keynotes, um, may, maybe seven, six uh, keynote talks and uh, very exciting presentations, uh, talks about the tools available, data sets available for this type of research. So we bring these um, uh, leaders and uh, create a platform so people can discuss further improvement ideas and share information, share their uh, observations. Uh, so that is going to accelerate more research in this area. And when you mentioned Wi-Fi in that context, uh, I know that Qualcomm's done some research around uh, using Wi-Fi signals to determine presence in a room, that kind of thing. Is that the sense in which you're using it? or more traditionally as a communication? That we showed we can do it. It is not only sensing the person in the room, but Sam, we actually know when person moves, where the person is with less than 10 centimeter accuracy, you know, depending on the number of like the Wi-Fi access points, it could be even better. So we know kind of like, and we can track people in these Wi-Fi or 5G environments. It could be your phone could be tracked, for instance. Um, uh, using these access points. Uh, but in addition to that, we can also, you know, estimate the body pose of the people. Uh, for instance, we will know that they actually fall down to 
ground and they need help or not. You know, those are the things that we are trying to accomplish. If there is a camera uh, in the system, it would make even uh, stronger. Uh, in this workshop, we are not really uh, presenting our work, but uh, our goal was to uh, accelerate the further research innovation in this area and support everyone, academia and uh, you know anyone interested in virus uh, uh, perception. Uh, and we will release some data sets as well. Uh, okay, great. Uh, there's also an omnidirectional workshop. What's that one about? Oh, yeah, there is, uh, there's also, uh, uh, so the previous workshop initiated at Qualcomm and uh, uh, kind of several Qualcomm members are in the organizing committee. They are chairing the event. Uh, omnidirectional computer vision workshop is another one. Uh, we have the similar setting. It is the third time of the third workshop. Uh, and uh, in this edition, uh, there are uh, many people um, from all around the different companies, autonomous vehicle companies and academia uh, joining this event, uh, showing, presenting ideas for um, a, a setting where cameras may not be just like our phone cameras, but could be fisheye cameras or 360 cameras. So omnidirectional uh, kind of indicates, in, uh, covers uh, cameras with wider, much wider field of view. Of course, those cameras have different geometries and uh, different type of uh, uh, images. If you look at, for instance, maybe uh, people who, you know, who are holding a, a stick, 360 images, those images look like, uh, not like the pictures we take in our uh, uh, phones, right? Uh, and uh, because of that, the uh, solutions, computer vision solutions kind of has to work in that setting rather than, okay, I'm gonna take this uh, funny image uh, and create a kind of like regular rectangular version of it. When we do that, we lose information. So there's a reason why there are dedicated solutions for uh, omnidirectional cameras. And this workshop uh, combines such uh, recent latest state-of-the-art uh, research uh, work uh, and provides a platform pe for people to discuss and uh, you know uh, learn from each other, uh, share their experiences. Um, one big application is uh, autonomous vehicles. As you know, autonomous vehicles have multiple cameras anywhere from you know, four, five, six, seven, including the internal one, external one. So you get a 360 feeling uh, um, uh, perception around the vehicle and uh, how you are going to uh, make sure uh, uh, all this information coming from these different cam cameras, some of them are LIDAR, uh, fisheye cameras, and there are other sensors can be combined in a way that you know, all the process Optimize works better at a higher accuracy, you know, more uh, robust manner. So these are the things I think people will be discussing, uh, and these are the uh, kind of uh, uh, some of the talks in the in that workshop as well. Awesome, awesome. And your team also usually uh, is showcasing some number of demos at uh, conferences like CVPR. Do you have any demos this year? Yeah, usually we brought, we try to bring mini demos. I, this time we are only bringing uh, two. Uh, and th there are much more demos at uh, CVPR for, from Qualcomm. I mean, I'm just talking about uh, kind of uh, my team, uh, Qualcomm AI research um, perception part. Uh, and one of the demos is uh, called as Oxidep, uh, Auxiliary Adaptation for semantic segmentation. The other one is uh, 4K uh, image super resolution. Oh, wow. Uh, so uh, folks who, uh, whether you saw that at CVPR or not, um, there's a blog post that we'll link to in the show notes and you might be able to catch those demos there. Well, Fatih, it was great chatting with you and congrats on so many accepted papers at the conference and uh, Looking forward to catching up again soon. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, thank, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. I hope, you know, sometimes I stayed very high level, but there are many things in the papers, you know, uh, 
kind of uh, I'm sure people will love the details we provide in the paper. Please let me know if you have any questions also later. Um, we'll definitely link to those papers in the show notes and uh, encourage folks to reach out if they have any questions.